Good evening and happy new year. Yes, we are ready. Uh, welcome to the first regular set, regular, boy. Hi, I'm the new president, so. <laughs> welcome to the regular board meeting of the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education. Uh, I get, I again que necesita interprete para la junta. Okay, uh, this meeting is being recorded and broadcast. Images and sounds may be captured of those attending the meeting. We will begin the agenda with the Pledge of Allegiance, which I'm going to make Vice President Fiak lead. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. All right, item 3B, approval of the agenda. I will entertain a motion to approve this agenda. Move approval. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We have an agenda. Next, item 3C, recognitions. Superintendent, Superintendent Munchi. Yes. <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Throughout the year, the Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education takes time to applaud members of our exceptional staff and students for their contributions to our schools and community. Tonight, we are pleased to recognize six students and two staff members who were recently honored by the Gilroy VFW post number 6309 for their achievements. I'd like to introduce Mr. Jesse Rizzo from V. FW Post 6309, who is in the audience tonight to help us recognize our honorees. Welcome. First, I'd like to begin by inviting the three students from South Valley Middle School to join us at the podium. Oh, we have two, okay. We have, please welcome Amari Joel. She's not here. Sophia Israde Lona and Kaida Seth. Hey. Amari, Sophia, and Kaida are all students in Dana Wolf's class and participated in the middle school Patriot Pen Essay Competition. The VFW Sponsored Patriots Pen Essay Competition encourages students to use their minds and knowledge of America's history and their experience of today's American society to write an essay expressing their view on a patriotic theme. More than 120,000 students who participated last year uh, participated last year in this nationwide contest. This year, the theme was, what is patriotism to me? 145 students from the Gilroy Unified School District entered the post 6309 contest, including 135 students from Mrs. Wolf's classes. Amari finished first, Sophia was second, and Kaida was third. All three students won a cash prize, and now they will move forward in the larger competition. Congratulations to all. We are so proud of you.
Next, I'd like to invite Giovanni Nidis, Alexis Silveria, and Gabriel Heredia to join us at the podium. These three students attend Christopher High School and they're members of Karen Scahill's class. They participated in the Voices of Democracy audio essay program, which provides high school students with a unique opportunity to express themselves in a democratic and patriotic themed recorded essay. This year's theme was, what are the greatest attributes of our democracy? Each year, nearly 25,000 9th through 12th grade students from across the country enter to win their share of more than 1 million in educational scholarships and incentives awarded through the Voices of Democracy program. All three students here won a cash prize and they will now move forward in the larger competition. Congratulations. We are so proud of you. And now for the final recognition of this evening, I'd like to invite Mrs. Lindsay Heck to join us at the podium. Mrs. Heck, along with her colleague, Mrs. Dana Wolf, has, they both have been recognized as the VFW Post 6309 Teachers of the Year. Unfortunately, Ms. Wolf was unable to join us tonight, but we have a recognition that will be sent to her site so her colleagues can celebrate her there. Mrs. Hack is currently the activities director at Gilroy High School, and she's also a parent of, stu of students in Gilroy Unified School District. She graduated from Gilroy High School, and her mom was a longtime educator in our district as well. Teaching is in her DNA. I'd like to read a brief excerpt from Lindsay's nomination that really encapsulates who she is an, as an educator and a valued team member of GUSD. I quote, when Mrs. Hack took on the job as activities director at Gilroy High School, it was immediately evident that her goal was to implement activities that taught young adults the importance of inclusion and citizenship. Activities were planned that would include all students, not just a select few. At a time when our country and world is divided, Mrs. Hack stimulates student discussions and interest about history and current events. She has instilled the importance of learning about and respecting the founding principles of our country, which is evident with her teachings of understanding and celebrating cultural diversity. Her ability to connect with people is innate. The leadership classroom is often filled with students that are not enrolled in her class. She often seeks out at-risk students, bringing them into her care. The connection and influence Mrs. Hack has on the young adults in Gilroy is reverent. Lindsay, reading these words about the impact you have made on the lives of our students, made it clear why you are so deserving of this recognition. So now she and Dana, they move on to the state level of the VFW Teacher of the Year competition. And of course, we are all rooting for you. Thank you for the difference that you make in the lives of our students and your colleagues around you. Congratulations to all on this well-deserved honor. All of you make us so proud.
Great job, everyone. Okay, next we come to general public comment. This portion of the meeting is reserved for members of the public to address the board on items within the jurisdiction of the Board of Trustees. If you wish to make a public comment, please submit a speaker card to the clerk. In accordance with board bylaw 9323, individual remarks will be limited to three minutes each. And we have... Oh, this is related to 8F. Okay, uh, we have one comment um, for the general public comment, and that would be Mr. Zapeta. Good evening. My name is Robert Cepeda. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone and the uh, board. Uh, I'm here again another year, and I bring news from the State Department of Justice Office of the Attorney General. Now, I don't speak on their behalf, but this was released to uh, all school districts uh, regarding uh, the, 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 oh, that's not one. Okay, here it is. The Office of the California Attorney General issues this legal alert to remind all school boards that the forced gender identity disclosure policies which target transgender and gender non-conforming students by mandating that school personnel disclose a student's gender identity or gender non-conformity to a parent or guardian without the school's express consent violate state law. So apparently keeping secrets from parents is legal, um, you know, and I was looking at your, your agenda here and seeing how, uh, the, you know, ta the tax revenue is much less. I wonder why, maybe because there's a lot more people leaving the state. And then I see at the bottom here as well that uh, there's a potential school closure. Uh, I wonder why less students are attending the district or just in districts in general, maybe because uh, I don't know, their parents don't want their kids being taught that two men can have a baby. Um, that could be uh, something to uh, allocate that. Uh, there's another one, uh, another legal alert. All these alerts so far regarding uh, gender, um, regarding the assembly bill 1078, which I've came here before and opposed for the school district to not apply here, but uh, you know, it's just regarding what books and curriculum to teach uh, here in, in schools. Um, I don't know why, uh, what are these books? Have you looked into them? Um, if it's regarding gender and sexual orientation, which specifically says right here, I don't know why do students need to be learned about sexual orientation, that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, um, this is just all wrong. And you know, it's just very obvious why people are leaving the state and leaving public schools in general. It's also too, because you close down the schools uh, for I don't know how many months uh, because, oh, and another thing too, it says if you don't conform to these laws, you'll be defunded. So you're being blackmailed and it's very interesting. But anyway, uh, that's all I have to say. Another thing too is stand up and avoid all this nonsense. Thank you. Uh, just to confirm, Ms. Grace, you wanted to speak on item 8F later in the meeting. Thank you. That concludes public comment. All right, item E, report of action taken in closed session. We had no closed session, so we have nothing to report. Um, Item four, the student board will not be happening this evening. Student couldn't make it. Which brings us to item five, the superintendent's report. 
Dr. Munshi. Good evening, board. Uh, I have a very short report because it was a short month. So uh, December 15th, we had our district <clears throat> office. We had the winter potluck, which has been a tradition. Um, staff meet for, what, for, for uh, about an hour and they eat together. Uh, December 16th, uh, several of you were with me where we went to uh, Supervisor Sylvia Arenas' uh, meet and greet. She has opened an office here in downtown Gilroy, uh, which is great for our community. Uh, and it was very nice to see all of you here. Uh, I think Trustee Pisano, you had just left uh, <laughs> right, right uh, after that we took this picture. Uh, December 18th through January 1st was winter break. Um, January 4th, I um, uh, actually met with one of our students from Christopher High School, Kiara Silver. Um, and uh, uh, Melanie had told me that I should prepare for an interview with Gilroy Life. And so we were expecting a reporter and in comes this young lady. Uh, and turns out she's one of our students and that's what she does. Um, she, she's pretty good too. Uh, I actually, as a follow-up, went back to Christopher High today and went to the Link Crew class and it was really nice uh, meeting and chatting with some of the students. I have to say our students are just so bright. It, it's always inspiring to meet students, talk to them, hear their ideas. So it was a great day. Uh, January 8th, we had our first SPAC meeting uh, for this year. Um, and then um, I, I had shared with you that um, in December, I started my mid-year check-ins with all our site administrators. So I'm continuing to do that. Um, I'm also meeting with some of you uh, for, for check-ins. January 18th, we'll have our GECA site visit. And then the three uh, events, okay, on Friday, which is tomorrow, is our first coffee with the superintendent. So I invite all our parents here and our board members, please come join us. Uh, we will not have school on January 15th for Martin Luther King Day, uh, uh, King Junior Day. And January 19th is professional development day. So students will uh, not be at school that day. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much. I hope you have a good uh, turnout for your coffee with the superintendent. It's our first one, so I had no idea. It could be just the three of us staring at each other and drinking a lot of coffee, or it could be the whole time. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. I believe it's uh, sponsored by Needed Bakery, so there might be good baked goods. And the location is? And the location is the Neon Exchange in downtown Gilroy. At 9 o'clock. 9 a.m. All right. This brings us to item six, the consent agenda. I will entertain a motion. Move approval. I'll second. We have a motion and a second for the consent. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We have approved the consent agenda. Item seven, public hearing. We will begin, we will have the public disclosure of the costs related to the tentative agreement between Gilroy Unified and the Gilroy Federation of Paraeducators, AFT Local 1921. Yep. Good evening, board. Good evening, superintendent, members of the public. Um, as President Pace just mentioned, this is a public hearing. Um, the uh, importance of this um, item is to publicly disclose the collective bargaining agreement and costs associated with the agreement between GUSD and the Gilroy Federation of Paraeducators, known to us as GFP, AFT Local 1921. Um, the specifics of the tentative agreement really mirror what the uh, district uh, governing board has approved for the teachers associations and the classified CSEA association, specifically uh, it includes a 2.5% salary increase retroactive to July 1st, 2023. Uh, obviously for employees um, on active status as a board approval, which is tonight, a 4% one-time off schedule payment uh, funded by one-time funds, increases to the district's benefit caps of health and welfare sufficient to absorb the increases that just took place on January 1st of this year. Uh, and then the district and GFP agree to pilot and participate in the California School Employees Summer Assistance Program that starts this coming summer. 
A total cost associated with the tentative agreement is $656,068. Um, included in your board packet is the typical disclosure collective bargaining agreement forms that I have shared with the county office. The county office has reviewed my multi-year projection, the associated disclosure requirement forms, and has since submitted uh, their letter uh, dated January 8th as well. And Dr. Munchi and I uh, certify that we can uh, meet the obligations of this agreement. Thank you very much. Uh, districts are required to disclose costs related to tentative agreements and have a public hearing. So this is an opportunity for the public to comment on this disclosure. Um, I will open the public hearing. Anyone would like to speak on this? Now is your opportunity. Seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Now we move on to item 8A, the approval of resolution 2324-13, updating the committed general fund balance. Mr. Thank you, President Lisa. Pace. Um, associated with the item that was just discussed and the subsequent items on the agenda, uh, as you'll remember, um, the board approved um, a resolution 23-24-12, committing portions of the fund balance in December, basically to uh, um, uh, comply with Proposition 2, setting limits on the district reserves to no more than 10%. It also complies with the board policy of a minimum reserve of 10%. That just happens to be the same number. Uh, in order for us to free up balances of the reserve to afford the cost of the tentative agreement, uh, we are basically uh, updating the committed balances uh, to be compliant with the Proposition 2 uh, threshold limitations on reserves. Thank you very much. Um, is there any, I will entertain a motion on this resolution. I second. Okay, any further discussion on the matter? Being none, we have a motion and a second. This is a roll call vote. Yes. 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 Abstain. Yes. Yes. Motion carries. And now item 8B, approval of tentative agreement between the Gilroy Federation of Peric Educators, AFT Local 1921, and Gilroy Unified for the 23-24 contract year. Mr. Winslow, Dr. Winslow. Thank you, President Pace, members of the board, Superintendent Mushi. Um, item 8B is the actual action item for the tentative agreement itself, as Mr. Meza already outlined. Um, I do want to recognize today we do have President Miss, uh, Miss Jackie Stevenson, who's here on behalf of GFP. And I do want to thank GFP for all that they do. Um, they are a joy to work with as well as a joy to bargain with. We're very lucky to have Jackie in her leadership role. So in front of the board as well as the public, we do actually have a copy of the tentative agreement that has been signed by both parties awaiting board approval. Um, and we also do have confirmation from Ms. Stevenson that GFP has formally ratified this agreement for the board to take action tonight. And we're requesting that the board approve action item 8B. That sounds great. Board, I will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All right. This is not a roll call vote. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I want to thank the board on behalf of the district and all that you do to ensure that our paraeducators and classified staff are um, considered in negotiations. So I want to thank the board. Um, we, again, we have great relations with GFP, and I know that they're equally as grateful for the board's dedication to their membership. So thank you so much. Thank you to staff and thank you to GFP. We appreciate getting this done. Thank you. Okay. Item C, public disclosure and approval of management and confidential and yard duty salary increase increases. Mr. Meza. Thank you, President Pace. Once again, good evening, everyone. Um, this is a public disclosure and approval. Um, so no separate action here and approval of management, confidential, and yard duty salary increase. The proposed salary increase um, for management confidential employees is aligned with what you just approved for GFP, what we have approved, what the board has approved for GTA and CSEA as well. 
again, specifically for transparency, um, the management um, confidential and yard duty aren't represented as a bargaining unit, but we still fill out the same disclosure forms, the same multi-year projections. Effectively, we treat management confidential employees and yard duties as if they're a bargaining unit for the purposes of filling out the disclosure forms, but they are not a bargaining unit. This is why we can simply take a disclosure item for approval without going through the public hearing process, but I'm outlining the same things anyway. The same um, is being proposed, a 2.5% salary increase for all management, all classified, all yard duty, retroactive to July 1st, 2023, uh, a 4% one-time uh, stipend uh, funded out of one-time funds, and the same uh, increases to health and welfare uh, retroactive to January 1st of this year. The same um, action will apply to all certificated management, all classified management, all confidential employees, superintendent, and two assistant superintendents. The total cost of the salary and benefit increase is 927,851, which obviously includes the 4% funded stipend of one-time funds. Um, that portion, the 4% is equal to 530,928. Uh, the same disclosure requirements were filled out. Uh, the multi-year projection was uh, completed as well, just as if it was a bargaining unit. Thank you, and I appreciate the, the transparency, even though we probably didn't have to do that. It's good practice, so thank you. Um, I will entertain a motion to approve this. Okay. Yes. Motion to approve. I'll second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I would like to abstain. Thank you. I'm and, also abstaining. Okay. We have five ayes and two abstentions. Motion carries. May, may I add a couple of comments or just no? How does that work with something like this? Good question. It's my first meeting. Um, <laughs> do, do, point right, of, right, do, right, do an important vote, but I don't see why it couldn't be. Yeah. We okay. couldn't have the discussion now because it's still part of the agenda. Sounds good. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, you know, I started with the district in 1980 and I became involved paying attention in the 1990s. And the math never worked for me. It never quite made sense. Uh, so in this, you know, the Me Too, it sounds like, well, we get the same. It's not the same, mathematically speaking. So a, a 2% on somebody who's making 100,000 is not the same as a 2% somebody making $200,000. <clears> so, you know, the, the previous one, like a 10%. So if somebody's making $50,000 and gets a 10% increase, that's $5,000 over the year. And if you divide by 12, that's, that's not too much per month. If somebody's making 100,000, you double that. So that person gets $10,000 for the year and so forth. You know, 200,000, they get 20,000. So it's not the same. Um, and I have talked with previous administrations about maybe we can think about looking at what would be fair and equitable versus just a blanket the same. And I'm, I'm gonna bring this up again and see where it goes. And it may not go anywhere, but I just thought I wanted to be on the record for explaining why I'm voting to abstain on this one. And the reason I'm not voting no, and the reason I'm voting you know, to abstain is I don't want anybody in management to think that I don't value the work that they do. Uh, I voted yes without any difficulty on the 10.5. And even though that was a bigger salary increase, and that was a me too also, I think everybody had gone through so much with COVID and so much in returning to a semblance of normalcy that I thought, no, I was com comfortable with that. I was also comfortable with um, giving the assistant superintendent for HR uh, more than the 10.5 because I thought that was completely justified because the comparables and we needed to fix that. Um, there's also some data that the district had, but it's two years old now. I'd like to see some more current data. It's, and I acknowledge that it's extremely difficult to get data from other districts because a, there is a lack of transparency and I'm glad that we're pretty transparent here. Um, I, I wish I could vote yes for the benefits. I think it's it does make sense for everybody to have the same as far as benefits, but as far as Salary is concerned. I, I know that the system is designed everywhere so that the less experienced people make less. 
But as far as you know, how hard people work, um, even you know, I at the top of the salary schedule was I working twice as hard as somebody at the beginning of the salary schedule? No, um, they were working just as hard as I was. So there's something inherently unfair about the way things work. Um, I know it's that's the way it is, but as far as giving the me too in the future, I, I really would like to look at a different way to accomplish this. So again, it's not a reflection on anybody in management. I really value the work that they do. They're working many hours, but so, so does everybody. But I understand that more responsibility. Um, I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. I just want people to think about this mathematically. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there further board discussion? Okay, seeing none. Um, we are done with this item. Okay. Next up, item D, the governor's January budget proposal for the 24-25 fiscal year. This is an information item. Mr. Mesa. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Trustee Pace. And if IT can help me, thank you so much, Marble, for your magic. Right on time. Um, the governor released the January budget proposal for fiscal year 24-25 at 10.30 a.m. yesterday. So I am doing my best to provide an overview, which is really an overview of what that proposal entails, has a lot of the language is still yet being developed. So I'm going to try to cover as much as possible, but know that it's not going to be exactly right because a lot of the trailer bill language specific implementation actionable items are yet to be developed. And then our workshop is even into next week to learn more about the budget. But I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't provide excuses. So I'll do my best. Um, but I will cover the highlights um, and I'll start with this, which I think for the benefit of the public, it's really key. So I'm talking about the January budget proposal. It is simply a step, the very first step in establishing a budget for the state. So what the state does is says, OK, look, let's look at revenue trends, uh, which were really complicated because uh, the IRS allowed the uh, taxes to be deferred from April to October and then push that out yet again to November. So this current fiscal year, the state was operating under really almost like a blindfold uh, in terms of revenue uh, and revenue picture. But for 24-25, this is really a draft, if you will, a, a, a signal of what the governor is seeing, how big the deficit is, what he's able to do, priorities effectively. And then he takes this draft of this plan for the state budget. And then he begins to negotiate with the state legislature about the priorities. You know, the, are they seeing eye to eye? Do they want him to cut? Do they want him to add, et cetera? That gets revised into what's called the May revision. And that's key because at that point, um, the cost of living increase, what we call COLA, um, which really augments uh, funding on the basis of the local control funding formula, that gets finalized until May. So, and more revenue picture, right? Like the revenue picture continues January all the way through April. Those are key tax collection months. And so effectively, if you go on the cyclical nature, uh, April taxes are reflected in the May revise. So normally that's what happens. So don't expect anything to be, you know, in stone from the information that I share with you today, but it is a very strong signal an important signal that we pay attention to, but know that it will get revised. And even after May, um, that continues until we have an enacted budget around June 15th. And that's really when it's key and locked in. And I am so glad I included this slide um, because I remember submitting this a week in advance. Uh, I think it was uh, the Tuesday that we came back, January 2nd, this is all done. And so part of uh, the information that um, uh, I updated will be highlighted in like red font at the end because I have I had to update it because the release of the governor's proposal was just yesterday. So I did my best to update the slides. Uh, but this one in particular was, you know, from the legislative analyst office. And that's really important to understanding what I'm about to say, because the legislative analyst office are a group of economists that are independently advisors to the California legislature. And all you need to know is that they think that the governor has a problem of worth $68 billion, that there's a shortfall in the economy of $68 billion. That's all you have to know. 
independent body looking at the, the revenues, and they think we have a $68 billion problem. And furthermore, they look at the trends in the upcoming years, and they know this problem isn't a one-off. It's going to continue to be a deficit, yes, uh, into the billions, but still beyond uh, $20 billion no matter what in the next subsequent years. Now, every economist is approximately uh, right, but exactly wrong, right? So there's some wiggle room in here. Um, but that's the number that the Legislative Analyst Office says is $68 billion. Fast forward to yesterday. This is the very first slide that the governor uh, put up. And that's the same slide, effectively, that he uh, began uh, about a year ago, um, basically highlighting the volatility in capital gains, uh, which is part of personal income taxes, which pay for roughly you know, 60% of the state revenues. And, but capital gains, only about 1% of the population in California pay for half of that. So half of that um, personal income taxes come from the wealthiest of Californians. And so their wealth is tied to you know, investments and the market. And so in 2022, we hit a peak. Um, let me see if I can highlight it here. Um, in the oops, in the peak was uh, eleven point five, I believe. You can't see it. Eleven point six. I can't. My vision is getting worse by the year. Um, and now it's five percent in terms of the assumption. So the volatility. He explained it as a EKG chart, up and down, up and down. It's just highly volatile. So our um, Proposition ninety eight funding, just to put it bluntly is tied to, to, to the, the fortunes of these one percenters. And so when they do well, we in California do relatively well because the state has the resources that come with that additional tax revenue. Now that 11.6 is now revised down to about 5% or so, and that's what he expects it to be um, in his assumptions. Bottom line is he scores the deficit not at 68 billion, he scores it at about 38 billion. Now that's a significant variance. $30 billion is not a rounding error, okay? Like I could anticipate a one or $2 billion depending on the segment of the budget and rounding, et cetera. If all that goes well, it's about one or $2 billion that, you know, on a $291 billion budget, maybe, yeah, sure. But 30 billion, that's a significant deviation from like a major assumption. Okay. So, but that's what he said. And the Department of Finance, you know, they're economists too, just as sharp as the LAO. But that's a huge variance. $30 billion off. That's that's huge. So the shortfall he's addressing is $30 billion less than the independent body is, is saying. So that that's really the fundamental. Uh, difference from um, our original assumptions in, in November. And the solutions he's looking at, uh, he's basically depleting the state reserves, not completely, but significantly. Um, and then he calls it tightening belting for like $12 billion in reductions in fund shifts and, uh, and, and accounting um, mechanisms and delays. And deferrals are basically um, delay payment delays, whether uh, and these payment delays have to cross fiscal year. So as an example, uh, in the recession years, districts have a monthly apportionment, right? An advanced apportionment. So that means I get paid in June, the June apportionment, meaning the district. So a deferral means the June check, if you will, um, it's paid in July. And that's important because the state scores this obligation as 11 month paychecks, if you will, rather than 12 because they're pushing that June obligation to the following fiscal year. Now, that's a trick you can do and continue to do uh, in, in the Great Recession that was done for multiple years. Um, but that creates a cash issue for those agencies that are relying on payroll. We don't defer payroll. We pay payroll when we, we're supposed to pay payroll. Um, but that leaves districts basically shift the cost obligation on cash basis to districts and local entities. And he's doing that to the tune of $7 billion. Um, so potential impact to GUSD, this just really summarizes it. And I'll touch on deferrals because I've, as I've learned, this does not impact K-12 education yet, but I think it does impact colleges and other areas of the budget. But the cost of living adjustment is really the key here. In November, we paid attention to the legislative analyst office and we said there is no way that the cost of living increase 
the projected original cost of living increase was 3.98%. So we have brought it down in December with first interim. Remember I said, okay, it's 1%. That's what we're hearing. It's 1%, it's 1%. Knowing that the COLA is finalized until May anyway, we know that that wasn't going to be the case, that it was going to be a final of one, but we reduced it to 1%. The COLA as of uh, the uh, January proposal is 0.76. Now the Delta from just about a year ago, when he established this budget, the enacted budget for 23-24, he had projected a COLA of almost 4%. The difference between an almost 4% and a 0.76 is $4.1 million less in revenue to us, to our district. And that's annual, okay? So that's annual, $4 million less, less revenue to the district uh, alone. Luckily, as I mentioned, we had already scaled back to 1%. Um, and so we already reflected that in December when we brought you the first interim. So we're really dealing with about a $309,000 uh, issue right now with the uh, proposal being what it is. Now, the CPI, uh, the Consumer Price Index, and other inflationary measures did increase just slightly in December. I think it rose by 0.3%, not material. But if every single month trends up like that, even marginally, then maybe that goes to 0.8 or 0.9 or something like that, closer to 1%. But as it stands right now, you know that that that's what it would be 0.76 percent and he's funding prop 98 at the bare minimum whereas in other years he gives us an additional augmentation cola you know you name it uh, because he has resources to do that um, this again is a scenario in which he is right and the whole is 38 billion not 68 billion so that's the scenario that we're dealing with the situation in which he banks that he's right and that the LAO is wrong. And the January proposal, that that that, that key piece of information that, that it says, um, it's not, um, I really have to get to, um, I don't know why I'm not able to highlight um, the, the font, but the, the January proposal includes payment delays for education. That's not true for K-12. So we're not dealing with deferrals yet. Deferrals are basically the IOU that I described that we get paid in July for things that should come in June. That's not true yet. So he does have that in the bank to go to. So that's a relief valve that he still has should he be wrong. And that is, that's important to us because as you'll see Irma talk about cash balances, we have plenty of cash. So rather than take a real budget cut, you know, give me all the deferrals right now. We can manage without even borrowing externally. We have plenty of cash as a district right now to manage that issue, should that be the case. So the next steps is just looking at, is there a mid-year cut coming? Remember 23-24, he cut with two years left out of the fiscal year, ahead of the establishment of the current active budget, 23-24. I'm sorry, cut, you said two years? It, I'm sorry, two days. Two Thank days. you, Trustee Pace. Two days? So two days before the start of this current fiscal year, it was June 28 or June 27. Two days before the start of the fiscal year, he cut learning recovery grant for that year and uh, uh, learning recovery and arts and music uh, discretionary block grant to the tune of $2 million for us. So with two years left in the fiscal year, he did that two days. I keep saying two years, two days. I think of fiscal year term. So two days, highly irresponsible, which is why probably what I'm getting it wrong. It's like if I say to you, with two days left out of the fiscal year, I'm cutting your, your paycheck. And to the district, it was a $2 million paycheck cut with two days out of that fiscal year. So he's done that already coming into this year. He guessed wrong, okay? And so he's putting up this budget. And during his press conference, over almost three hours, um, I listened to a question and answer period from a press guy. And he said, should the legislature ask me to move faster and implement cuts, I have nine items that I'm willing to look at. So he's already opening the door, almost inviting the legislature. He's a politician. So he's almost inviting the legislature to press him. And then he'll pull the trigger on the cuts. So then he can say, oh, I didn't do it. It was the legislature that made me do it. Um, but that is something important to us because he's already done it 
that late in the fiscal year, and here's January, he could perfectly be able to do that again and cut current year allocations is what I'm saying. So we're in this business of we think we have this money and we think we have this projection and this multi-year that I share with you, but that could all be, you know, at a snap of a wrist or a finger pulled under the rug from us and then we're dealing with mid-year cuts. Uh, and obviously the final call that will be implemented in May and then we'll update the multi-year projection as soon as we have more information. But this is just an informational item. Well, that wasn't very good news. Uh, <laughs> trustees, any questions or discussion? Who is that? Trustee Good. Has there been any discussion of deferrals applying to COLAs like they did in years past? He started the, 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 the deferral piece that he did implement um, because I wrote this and I updated this slide when I saw that 7.2 billion delays and deferrals. But that he didn't apply to Prop 98. So there's other areas of the budget, healthcare and other areas of the budget. He is pushing deferrals. So thank you, Trustee Good, for that, because he is already starting to do that, but not to Prop 98 education. So our Prop 98 is 109 billion at the state, the total share. So he hasn't yet done that to education, but he's depleted the reserves, which is why I keep saying Prop 2 law is so silly, because he's depleting his reserve. I have to do what we did just a few minutes ago with the committed balances so that I can keep, you know, more reserves in the 10% by, by committing those balances so that we could be fiscally solvent, right? Um, but that's why this law is so silly, but he has not yet hit Prop 98 yet with the deferrals yet. Trustee Pacena. Thank you. Um, I've never seen a difference of $30 billion between the LAO and a governor. Is that, I mean, that's pretty unusual. I have not either. And I've been in public education, you know, this uh, since 2002, all in school finance and the one or $2 billion, sure. And, and there's always good explanation for those variances, but not $30 billion. Yeah. That's substantial. So when I heard that yesterday and I was reading up on that, I was um, shocked. That, uh, about that big difference. I'm probably more concerned about this budget than I have been in a while. Um, I've been in public ed a little bit longer than you <laughs> since 1975. Um, and I remember the days of uh, 2002 and the cuts that came. I also remember days where we got cuts in the middle of the year for that same year, not for the following year. So when you say, you know, the governor's a politician, the whole entire legislature is a, are politicians. So it would not surprise me if um, there there is going to be a lot of horse trading between now and May. And I would not be surprised if we don't get a budget by June 15th. And it goes beyond that. And um, it's going to be a tough year. He says he's holding uh, K-12, you know, out of the cuts as much as he can. Um, he set himself up as the education governor. Yeah. And um, as you said, he's going to say, you know, but the legislature is, is making me do these cuts. And they will because they're going to have to if, if they're talking $68 billion. So um, buckle up, buttercup, it's going to be a tough ride. <laughs> The only other thing I would want to mention, and thank you, Trustee Pisano, is the the legislative analyst office came up with that sixty eight billion in late November, like really late November. So yes, the Department of Finance, they're the group of economists that develop these estimates for the governor. They had one more month of data, so maybe outside chance in that one month was that a thirty stellar billion month, in a month. But I, I doubt it. But I just want to give them the benefit of the doubt. And, their boss is a politician. <laughs> it's, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for this informational item. Next, we come to item E, update on GUSD enrollment projections from Decision Insight slash PowerSchool. This is also an information item, Mr. Mesa. Thank you, President Pace. Um, I will walk through the enrollment projections knowing that the final narrative report isn't uh, uh, completed or even in draft form from Decision Insight, our demographers. 
but the data is meaning the numbers, the projections, the key pieces of information. So rather than delaying it and bringing it to you in February, which will it wouldn't be good for timing purposes uh, to develop staffing, um, et cetera, uh, I'm bringing you the data, what matters the most. Uh, but the narrative report will, will be shared, of course, with the board when that is completed. Um, I wish that one of the speakers in public comment was still here because he did speak about some of these things, but unfortunately he had to leave. Uh, but I'll touch on the birth data, both nationally, California, what's going on globally, and then I'll zoom in into what's happening in Gilroy and obviously give you a history of enrollment uh, and then naturally getting to um, the projections for next year, 24, 25. Um, so this is US birth data. So. It goes all the way back to 1950, and you can see just the trend, less birth, you know, number of births, less people being born, obviously less kindergartners that we have in the system, right? So that's where the decline happens. It all goes back to births. It's just natural. And so on the bottom, is just the annual change. So I'm not going to spend too much time. Just know that the nation as a whole has been declining in terms of uh, population growth births. And so we see that in California. Uh you know, a hundred year low in terms of birth counts in California. I'll say that again, a hundred year low in births in California. So you're not going to get kinder booms or first graders coming into your school system because they're just not being born. It's not something that GUSD is doing. It's not something that Santa Clara County is doing or that California is doing. It's, they're just not being born. Um and so this is our birth data in our own zip code. And I don't make this data up. It's from the, um, oh God, I don't remember the acronym, California Health and Human Services, uh, .gov. Uh, and you can, if you're online, you can click on the link. It's a live link. It takes you to this massive Excel file. You sort and then you plot. And that's the data. So this was released uh, in late December, that 744 uh, is the latest plot. Um, they're basically a whole year behind. Uh, so I plotted the latest data and you can see in our own zip code, it's the lowest point on that chart. So we're not anticipating enrollment growth, right? If you just look at these numbers, we're not going to have them. And by the way, that that's a hundred percent of the births in, the, in our zip code we get about yeah, maybe 75 to 80% of those numbers translated into kinders five years later. Um, so that's also relevant, right? Um, and then- the, And in case anyone's curious, that, that means the child lives in 95020, not yeah. necessarily they were born at a oh, hospital in 95020. Yes. Thank you, Trusted Pace, for that. Um, and the declining enrollment isn't you know, a surprise to us. We have been monitoring this for several years. We know the indicator, the downward sloping, uh, line, of course, uh, and the projections. This is a projection that um, the Department of Finance, the same economists that work for the governor, did way back when. And you know, 2031, you can see the the downward sloping decline in terms of enrollment. So it's again not something that Gilroy Unified is doing. The decline is happening throughout the California and really the nation. And this is really uh, our historical enrollment. And then I want to speak a little bit about that last bar. Um, so we hit our peak in enrollment, as you can see, in 1617, totaling 11,483 students. And last year's um, almost final uh, enrollment count is 10,243. I say almost final because that gets certified in February. Um, so right now we're almost there. We may be five or so, uh, give or take five or plus uh, five students variance, but substantially that will be the number. And that'll mean that we've declined about 186 students from the prior year. So that the, the decline continued into this current year. Um, and, you know, why is this happening, right? Like the, the speaker doesn't know why it's happening. He's just guessing. Um, well, there's a EdSource article here that was published on December 18th that caught my eye. Uh, about roughly 28% of students, they just don't know, right? Whether they're moving out of the area or whatever. Um, but it's really the decline in births, uh, age population in public schools are declining because of that. It's not really private schools, only a 27,000, uh, 8,400. Um, it, it's just not that substantial. So overall, uh, yes, 
we're losing to private schools and homeschooling, um, but a significant portion is remains unexplained, about 28%, probably out of the area. They don't really um, have a grip on that, but really it all comes down to fewer births. They're just not being born. Um, and this is really an important slide because I try to capture next year's projection with the historical data and what the preliminary enrollment was. And I want to just spend a few seconds on that. We, uh, every single point in this, um, every single column represents the first Wednesday of October for that given year. So expect to see some variances if you're saying, well, in this slide enrollment was this, and then this slide, it's because every single point in this is the first Wednesday in October. And you'll see that the 2324 column adds to 10,055. Well, I just showed you a 10,243 number. That's because that's more refined in terms of not being preliminary. It's almost final. Um, but every single gray column is a certified February number for that given fiscal year. And it's important that we look at enrollment as a snapshot. So the state says every district in California, you will take that enrollment snapshot on every Wednesday of every single year. And then you'll do your homework to make sure that you account for that student in the right place and you have until February to do so. And that becomes that beautiful column every single year. So we can change it. I know enrollment fluctuates, right? Like enrollment is different today than it was on that first Wednesday in October. But those numbers represent the first Wednesday in October. And that's where there's a variance. The important column there is uh, the yellow, the projection for next year out of our demographers just put into the table that I track. So total enrollment next year is expected to be 10,057. Notably, among the elementary cohorts, it's pretty stable. Uh, a total growth of 33 students total, you know, a population of 4,200 and change. That's flat. So the good news is the enrollment in, among the elementary campuses is it's stabilizing. Um, the bad news, as we know, is that bubble uh, the climb bubble is moving into the LM, uh, to the middle schools and high schools. Remember, this year's senior class is the only class uh, that is above a thousand, in meaning like the cohort. Like so, if you take every single senior in our schools, that's the only and add them up. That's the only class, twelfth grade class, that's a thousand being replaced by a smaller class of like five eighty or so in kinder. So once they graduate, it's no surprise we're gonna get smaller. And so that's why the, the, the decline is projected to continue. Uh, and you'll see that in, in a little bit clearer fashion in the subsequent slides. But I did want to point out where the decline is. Middle school and high school is moving through that little bubble. And this is another a projection single year forecast, again, from uh, Decision Insight Predictive Enrollment Analytics. Uh, and that's the same, you know, 10,057. And you're seeing subsequent slide that 10,057 might be off by a few. That's because obviously they're still in draft form, but that's the number that we're going with. And then in this one in particular has the, what they call open seats, because uh, they've taken the capacity of elementaries into account. We haven't done that for the secondary, but I'll ask that we start doing that for all grade levels. So it's nice and clear. There are no, there is no capacity issues at our campuses because as we've seen historically, we've declined by about 1,240 kids since 1617. So clearly we don't have a capacity issue at our sites. But what this tells you is uh, the TK, the transitional kindergartner class goes to 261. That's this first number here. Across the districts, that's 261, up from 180 or so this year. So that means for sure, for sure, as we start adjusting for those basically four-year-olds to come into our system, uh, we're going to need at least two additional classrooms at least uh, to accommodate for that growth in transitional kindergartner. That's what's confusing, right? We're declining overall, but we're adding two classes at that specific cohort because if you look at that 12th grade class, is no longer 1,000, is 900 and just barely, right? So, And if you look at the bottom of these, this is what I was referring to, 900, 800, seven, six, and then we get to another seven before we get to another five. So that's why it's not gonna be a surprise as these kids um, age out of a system um, that the 10 year projection clearly indicates that our footprint's gonna shrink as a district.
Um, and this is just purely gray level, 261, et cetera. Um, the, the forecast here is the 2024 year because it's 24, 25 year, et cetera. And you can see the total enrollment in 10 years from now, it's going to be 8,300. So naturally, we'll update this as we did a year ago. Every single year in January, we have the same topic, the same conversation, discussion on enrollment, discussion on school closure. It's every year. It's not, it's, it's not anything else other than that. Every single year, we have an obligation to look at enrollment, look at school closure. Uh, this is the same graph. Uh, I mean, same numbers. It's just a graph. This clearly lays out the pattern. Uh, last year, we declined by 185, the same as expected for next year, and the projections to where we're headed. Um, the next uh, steps, is the very next item, is a feedback uh, and an annual discussion on possible school closures. Obviously, I work closely with Mr. Winslow and HR on staffing needs as we develop uh, the budget for next year. And we adjust, as we always do, when necessary. Thank you for the yet another dire presentation. <laughs> I'm on a roll. Uh, trustees, any comments or questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. We will go to item F, discussion on potential school closure. This is also an information item. Uh, thank you, President Pace. Again, this is an information item that we bring annually at the request of the governing board. Um, and so I'll start with uh, just uh, reviewing birth data, but we just saw those enrollments. So I'll just really skip through those since I literally just went over them. But for the purposes of the presentation, I needed to include it in there just for to be uh, thorough. I do want to mention the this this boxed area on the bottom. There are additional reference materials in your documents that lay out the process of a school closure recommended from the California Department of Education uh, and the timeline we took for the closure of ADB. Um, and we saw that um, this is a, a slightly different way of looking at it. It's adding the kinders and TK. And this is only there to highlight the fact that those four-year-olds effectively are coming into the system because that was the TK law. And so I just put this in there and added them together so you can see that, yes, there are the additional students coming in in TK because of that age um, uh, adjustment. And so we will have to open up two classrooms in TK. This is the same identical slide, so I'm not going to speak to it again. Um, the same um, enrollment projections. I really did this in case somebody just went to that item and didn't have the context of the enrollment and, and things that we just discussed. This is a new slide. And this is, I thought, was helpful from Decision Insight from their a year ago report um, in which they looked at um, the current enrollment. Now, these will slightly have a, a variance on the 23-23 October count. Um, they're not the almost final count that I just shared, but they're relatively close. And what they do is they say a five-year projection. So five years from now, where are we? 10-year projection, because remember, it's a 10-year window horizon that we look at. Uh, and then we just basically split it up. And this is really just a helpful way of looking at it. In five years from now, relatively to today, are we gonna decline or grow? And just about everybody, other than Gekka, Solorzano, and Aroble, is going to be declining in five years from now, just about everybody. Uh, El Roble is pretty consistent. It's probably the only one in a 10-year horizon that's really relatively stable with a decline of 1%. Uh, mm -hmm. Relatively speaking, from 561 to 556, that's pretty stable if you want to look at just the raw data there. Um, but this is just a flag of double-digit decreases in most of our campuses, here in a five-year window, about half of our schools are seeing a double-digit decline. Um, in 10 years out, most schools are going to see well into a 20% and some even close to 30% decline. Again, just births. It's just math. It's just age. It's just, it's just what it is, but we know what we're getting into. Um, and this is just looking at elementary projection and then adding capacity in those open seats that I spoke about. And I thought the utilization column was helpful, uh, particularly because we have one of the elementaries getting, you know, larger than others, whereas others are still hanging around 400, uh, 500, et cetera. But it's important to know the capacity that the school site is 
classroom-based design for additional capacity. So we have to put it in context. And so that is utilization. Um, utilization at Las Animas is at 88%. There's at 86% at Luigi, very comparable. 84% at Robobla, but it's all relative, right? The footprint's smaller at other sites. So that's why the utilization is important. However, Las Animas is at 843 um, that's important because Las Animas is around, you know, a, a residential development. I'll get to that in a minute, but it does present a balancing issue. Maybe not. It's just the size of particular elementaries. And again, that's a reflective of capacity. So I'll be the first to tell you by design, Las Animas is the largest by design, 953 versus others that are clearly smaller, right? So is just uh, we, obviously the balance is based on capacity, so the capacity is there. Now the projection is that by 2627, Las Animas will be 855. That could be wrong. That could be completely off. It's just a projection, but it is what it is. Is the information we have right now, well within capacity. Capacity is 953. The only issue that I bring this, it's it's that we have to acknowledge, and that's just simply what it is. Is an acknowledgement that the non-classroom facilities. And by that, I mean the multi-purpose room, the library, all those other facilities feel compressed. And that's particularly true of Las Animas because the two-story building happened after, after, and that's key. The, the kitchen, all those facilities that I just mentioned here were designed, and then the two-story building came after. And that's why this is relevant to this conversation, uh, only because it feels like the site's getting compressed in those things. So people see traffic congestion, right? And you will see more of that as uh, Glen Loma Ranch development builds out as those homes become occupied. That's really the point here. And then this is also, I thought, helpful. Um, I have a decision insight plot where this is not made up data, every single student and the boundary. So I overlap plot the students, uh, Las Anima students, which this is early January, probably during my break. Uh, it was during my break. So uh, not on the clock, uh, but 766 students, that's substantially that's different fun. than the October, <laughs> than the October seabed. So this is not the official California first Wednesday of the of, of, of the year or in October. Um, this is just um, probably, I don't know, December, Christmas, I don't know, so, sometime there in the holiday. 766 was the enrollment count there based on actual students. And so what this is, is Las Animas boundary and about 75% of the students reside and attend, that's the key, uh, uh, Las Animas. And about 25% or so, about 200, I'm just going to round up, about 200 students attend Las Animas for you know, other reasons, um, programs there, et cetera. Um, but that's key. It's about 200 students that attend. So we uh, think that resident, resident kids should attend the residential schools, right? And that's a big thing. So with Glen Loma being um, still building hundreds of homes around Las Animas, that 576 that's going to be in this uh, boundary, it's going to continue to grow. So the, the question is really just the acknowledgement is we're still going to have about 200 students coming in from outside Las Animas while this 576 grows. And so that, that'll that be, obviously it's all incorporated into the projection, but that's why you see Las Animas coming up um, faster and growing faster um, than any other campus. Bottom line is um, the staff cabinet, I recommend no school closure, obviously for 24, 25, we're looking at it closely. We track it, we discuss it annually. Um, but should we consider balancing uh, those things where we have a site of 800 and change and others to 400, um, given what we know about the non-classroom facilities, that's one thing that we can do is explore programs that feed into Las Animas it, basically the kids that we put there because we have a district-wide program there. It's about 200 kids of uh, give or take at Las Animas as an example, as an example of, of something that could alleviate congestion at the sides, pressures of the kitchen, playground, et cetera. Those kinds of things are topics for discussion that we could consider. But again, there's no capacity issue in terms of uh, housing those kids in a classroom. 
So again, this is just an informational item, uh, primarily discussing the recommendation from staff not to close the school for next year. Thank you for the report. We have some public comment on this item. Uh, first up is Cynthia Grace. You uh, please go up to the uh, mic and you have three minutes. Hi, good evening. I'm a parent of Las Animas. I'm actually here regarding that last slide that we just saw. So that last slide was um, brought to our attention from a parent from Las Animas. And we are here because we wanna see if the board can please take us into consideration. Um, specifically under that one slide where it says that you are exploring the um, option of moving DI out of Las Animas. Um, one of our board members said earlier that you guys are transparent and um, we feel that uh, even though it's just an exploring option, even though this is just informational, like Mr. Mesa just said, that's something that would have a huge impact to us. We have 300 DI students there at our school and we weren't told that that's something that you guys are exploring. So the transparency hasn't been there with our Las Animas parents. And that's why we're here tonight because we are, we want to be taken into consideration. We want that transparency. So if it's something that you guys are gonna be exploring, um, we would like to be told ahead of time. We would like our voice to be heard. Um, we wanna know what the other options are why is this uh, this huge move that will impact 300 students um, the only option? Are there other options? Has the zoning been explored? Mr. Mesa gave us a really good slide about the zoning before um, the Glen Loma construction was happening. Um, have you considered the effect of the DI program of incoming students? Has anyone taken into consideration the composition of the program? the one-third English only, the one-third bilingual, the one-third Spanish speaking only in order to make it a successful program. Um, who's in charge of ensuring that the program will continue to be successful? All of these concerns and questions happen because one parent saw this one bullet and nobody was aware. So we ask you to please be transparent, to please include us in these options that you're exploring to please come up with some kind of committee where parents are involved, especially the parents that are gonna be impacted at Las Animas, whatever school they move to, that school is gonna be impacted. South Valley will be impacted. If they are moved out of our home school, then a lot of the parents are not gonna to wanna to stay in DI. And DI, I'm afraid, is going to um, lose numbers. And then maybe South Valley will lose their DI students if they're not going to be in their home school. So it's a request from a parent that has a fifth grader, a fourth grader, and a second grader in DI. Um, I would like those to be taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we just learned about it when this was posted on Friday as well. Uh, we also have public comment from Alice Verick. Good evening. Um, I'm Alice Verich. I'm also a parent of a DI student at Las Animas and was just told about this last night myself. Um, I'm new to Gilroy. I'm new to the, the public school system. And, and so I've got three children, one in middle school, one in high school, and one in elementary school. And the idea of the DI program, that was one of the things that drew me to the school district here and not putting them into the private school or things that we were in prior to moving to Gilroy was this program. If this was to move out or if it was to be eliminated from Las Animas, uh, my, my student would not be able to do that. We would pull him out and we would be going to a private school to make sure he has other opportunities. Um, if, the, if the children are, the DI program has decided to be um, just moved to another school, I think the, kid, the, the parents and the, the people that are already enrolled in the DI program 
in Las Animas, where this is our home school, we are in the district, should be given then the option to choose whether or not we go to Rod Kelly or we go to the new um, school that we'll be given. Um, if I, I had heard Glenview may be an option, that's all clear on the other side of town. I've got kids in Christopher High School. I can't get kids to both schools, therefore I can't do it. So we're gonna, either gonna have to add staff for driving buses so that we can start picking up children and moving them over, or we're gonna have to look at other options. Um, I would appreciate, again, that we get notified as parents of this, of any decision or any discussion to, to inform that decision should be given um, the parents the opportunity to do our own research, to do our own reading, to be informed so that we can come to you with our concerns and have an educational discussion about this, right? An informed discussion about what the best interests of our students and our kids are. Um, I understand numbers, I, I'm a numbers person myself, but at the end of the day, this isn't, my children is, my child isn't a number. He's He's my child and deserves the education that we've signed up for. Um, and and we've, we jumped through a lot of hoops to get them into the DI program, I'll be honest. So to put this on the, on the thing and say that it's an option for next fiscal year or next school year, that's, that's not a lot of time to give us that time to do that informed discussion. Um, and then I just, I did have one question. I know you can't answer it because it's public comment, but in the, the 8E slide, um, the one online shows the capacity for all the schools to be about 9,000 or 8,500 actually, but that our current enrollment is 10,000. So I'm not quite understanding the, the numbers. If our capacity, if we're over capacity by 1,600, why that is not showing up on the, the numbers here. So I would just ask you to look at that slide. Clearly our capacity is greater than 12,000 or whatever we peaked at. So. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good input. Uh, uh, boards, let's have a discussion. Ms. Um, Go for it, James. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to reiterate what Mr. Pace said that we learned about this when the packet came out. Um, we are not doing the exploring. The district's doing the exploring. It's not, it's not us doing that part of it. Um, I would like to know how many, and, and you might not know this now, but it would be nice to eventually know how many students that are in the DI program at Los Animas live in that attendance area. Yeah, Just I don't know that off the top of my statistically, head. Statistically, not individually. I, I, I do want to clarify what I think Trustee Pace and everybody's saying. It's this the board, this is the first time the board hears about this. Yeah. Okay. It's staff is our job to inform the board, hey, there's options here. So it's Explore option. That's one of the many things as I was a parent of Las Animas. My yes. kid went to K-12. I mean, they had two. Uh, my my son and my daughter went through. One was a DI, one wasn't because he's a special ed student. But they both went through Las Animas. So I live there and I know how important DI is. This is an exploration. Mm -hmm. Should we want to look at the balancing issues of Las Animas? Because I have, I've hear from parents. I've been the rep from Las Animas the cabinet rep for Los Angeles for like 10 years, okay? So I hear from parents about the congestion, the traffic, how difficult it is when you have a function at Los Animas to even get to see your child and have a, a recital. So this is just an exploring, right? So that the residential uh, the kids can get to it. And the exploring piece wasn't next year it's done, DI is moved. It, it would be gradual over time so that students in currently in the DI, every single one of you get there would finish the DI there. So it, we're talking about new enrollment to next year. Would, if the board directed us to do that. Now, this is the very first time that they hear about this. Okay, so I want to be clear. Staff so, has identified a problem yes. and has been brainstorming and they threw out a, an idea that we're now yes. discussing. I, yes. If I may add, so yes, this is the first time. This is not a decision that's been made, like many other decisions. When the board has requested to bring every year in January a report on enrollment, for example, because the staff, we gather data, we bring our projections to you, we bring our recommendations to you, 
uh, when we had to close ADB, I think uh, Mr. Mesa mentioned earlier, it wasn't just at the drop of a hat okay, that we yeah. said, we are going to close ADB in July. It was a two year process. These things are not that simple, but uh, the staff, we, we look at all the options. Uh, we talked to the principals, Ms. Kodiga, actually, we had, a, we had a conversation with her about this last week. And I said, do you have any ideas? Because we are still exploring. And she said, no, I don't. So, you know, here, uh, and I, again, this, I, is, not I, this is not the that, venue for that. Well, what we had told Ms. Kodiga is these are just options we're exploring. We'll obviously be working with the community at Los Animas. And just like Mr. Mesa mentioned, we get emails from parents all the time recommending that we redraw boundaries. I just want to point, point out, even when we do that, you are going to push some families out. And I'm sure those families at that point will be sitting here saying, why my, why my residence? How did you make this decision? These are not easy decisions. And anytime we make these decisions, we, we have to be mindful. Some families will be pushed out and those families will be lined up here then saying, how did you redraw the boundaries and who made the decision about where the lines are drawn? Because somebody will have to. The, the challenge with Los Animas is, and, and all of you, I, again, I, we hear from parents, they're lined up for hours to pick up their kids. It's a safety issue. We have heard about uh, the NPR, about the cafeteria being too small. I have heard from Ms. Kodiga about not getting enough rotations in the library for students. So these are issues that we are hearing from the school, from the community, and we have to be proactive. We have not made any decisions, but it is our responsibility to bring these to the board so that at least we can keep adding on some ideas and then when, when it is time to make a decision, we are well informed. So I, I again want to emphasize there are no decisions made. The board, this is the first time they're hearing about it because we wanted to bring this as an information item. If you notice they're not making any decisions tonight, there's no action being taken. It's purely informational and it goes right along with the enrollment projections. So it makes sense to start looking. As you saw, uh, Las Animas right, right now, 75%, uh, only 75% of the student population is actually residing in Los Animas boundaries, right? 25% yes. come from somewhere else, from other neighborhoods. At the same time, we saw in the projections, uh, at some point, 88%, uh, Los Animas is at 88% capacity already. And over the years, we saw some of the other schools will be at 60, 65% capacity. It's very hard to make decisions to close schools. It is, as a school district, hard to operate a school that has, a, that has an enrollment of 400 kids. But, and we've done that with ADB a few years ago. But then when we close a school, we also have to figure out what do you do with those 400 students now? And what is the impact on other schools when we ship off those? So these are not easy decisions. And, and I agree, um, nobody's child is a number. But what we want to do is we want to make sure all our schools are, we can operate them in a way that's safe, where students have a good educational experience. Uh, that is the goal of, of our staff. And, you know, that, that's what we bring to the board. Uh, but I don't think it is our intent to make any decisions in isolation. Uh, there is full transparency. We, it's a very, like we literally had this conversation just a few weeks ago with, with the principals and uh, talked to them about the DI program. Because at this point, given the 25% students who are there because they're enrolled in the DI program, that was something we started looking at initially, right? But again, no decisions have been made. Uh, we will obviously be working through this. Um, and we also, I think the numbers clearly show we only have two other schools or three that have declining enrollment. So it's just a, it's a mathematical thing. We cannot extend the NPR. We cannot add more classrooms. Uh, those are not sustainable ideas. We, so these are just some ideas we are, we are looking at. Please. Yes. I just wanted to say that 
some of the issues. Could, could you speak into the mic and introduce Sorry. yourself? Yes, my name is Ji Young Pak, and I do have a daughter that goes to the DI program at Las Animas. Part of the problem I feel like the decrease in decline in schools is the parents. The busing is a major issue. All the parents in Las Animas do not have much busing. So every parent, one parent has to bus, drive them to school, drive them back. So a lot of that, those issues I think is part of the decline in numbers. And I think maybe all those schools, I don't know. But so that's part of the, the complaint I wanna present is that when people are complaining about congestion at Las Animas, it's not because there's so many kids, it's because every parent one by one has to go and drop them off. Eagle Ridge, I live in Eagle Ridge. Eagle Ridge, we maybe have like 50 kids. And most of them, all of them go to Las Animas, but we don't have a bus. We each have to every morning drop them off and pick them up. So those are some of the issues I wanted to bring up. It's not just um, the numbers of kids and not just the crowding, but the issue, the major issue also is busing. Um, and also I just feel like there's a lot of issues that are presented like as a big picture, but not really looked at in in detail. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Uh, trustees, let's have a discussion. Any comments or questions about the presentation? I think it's good news we don't have to close the school. Let's start there. <laughs> Trustee Paseno. Thank you. I think it's a great um, issue that we don't have to close a school at this point. And um, as trustees, we had asked, as uh, Mr. Mesa said, for information on enrollment, because that will drive um, our need to set up a committee to look at closing a school. So the information we have at this point, no need for a committee. And if we close a school, two years, two years is the process to do that. So we need advanced planning for that. It would not happen in this district in the fall or even the fall after that. So we do, um, and there's a lot of pre-planning that goes along. We have three out of our seven elementary schools that have less than 500 kids. And we have three of our elementary schools that have more than 700 kids. That's a huge difference. We are responsible for, for all 4,200 of the elementary kids in this district. And we understand my kids went through Gilroy Unified. The only ones that you're interested in are yours. I get that. Those are the most important to you. 4,200 are important to us. And we need to have um, equitable experiences for all of our kids. And for kids going to a school with less than 400 kids, as opposed to kids going to an elementary school with 850 kids, it's not the same at all. And yes, we have gotten lots of concerns from parents at, at Las Animas about the kitchen, about the NPR, about the library, about even um, the playground, that there are too many kids. And certainly I have been out there the beginning of school and seeing the traffic. And yeah, it's a nightmare out there. I get it. So we're, we automatically think, uh, no, I won't say we, I automatically think, okay, let's have fewer kids there. That makes sense. Because we have other schools that have, aren't anywhere near 88% capacity. And that's not fair. So what can we do besides close a school? And the fact that we don't have to close a school is great news. Um, as was said, and when you close a school, you have 400 kids, 500 kids, and we have to move them elsewhere. That impacts everybody. Somebody mentioned uh, changing boundaries. Trust me, I do not want to be on this board when we change boundaries. I was working the last time, I was working in Gilroy Unified the last time we changed boundaries. It is a nightmare. And this room was filled every meeting with parents 
who didn't want to be changed out of their area, even though their kids, some of their kids were only three years old because they anticipated going to a school. Boundary changing is a nightmare. And if we can manage not to change boundaries and not to change, not to close a school, that's a win-win. And the further we put that off, and if we can do other things to make those experiences for your kids, for all of our kids, hallelujah, let's do those things. I don't want to affect 4,200 elementary kids, okay? And I know you're frustrated because of the meeting set up, all right? But um, I know that there will be, I, I assume, that there will be parent meetings set up. I shouldn't say no, I assume. And that your feelings will be um, heard because it's important that we hear from you. Absolutely. And I'm glad that you came and I'm glad that you saw the enrollment um, report so that you kind of start to understand. We live with this all the time. For you, it might be the very first time you've seen it, all right? And we're responsible, like I said, for all kids in this district, um, fewer and fewer though they may be. But for you to see that you understand the decisions that we have to make in order to provide a good equitable, and equitable doesn't mean equal. It means what kids need for all kids in this district. We do the best we can. And um, like I said, I don't want to affect 4,200 elementary kids. That's not the goal of this board, and that's not good for kids or for families. Will we affect some families? Yeah, we will. And there's no lie to that. And some of you will not be happy. Um, and, and for that, I apologize ahead of time. They're tough decisions that we have to make in order to provide good quality education for all kids. And I'm sorry, you're not all gonna be happy, but we'll do the best we can for the most and the best for as many uh, kids as we can. But we're not making any decisions tonight. Those decisions are down the road. This is the first night that we've heard it too. We have a little bit more information because we see this enrollment information all the time. So it's not, that's not new to us. It's new, it's probably new to you. And it's kind of shocking. And, um, but thank you for coming tonight because this is your first night of seeing this information and informing yourselves. That's important too. And informing other parents and having, starting to, to, um, form an opinion and some concerns because we need to hear those too. Staff needs to hear those and then they will bring them to us. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Trustee Paseno. Anybody else have a comment? I, I would, Trustee I would, Good. I would, Trustee Good, yeah. I, I, would, I would just add, we have an election coming up this year. There's going to be three <laughs> board seats up. So you want to be part of the process? Come on down. Come on down. <laughs> Please. And I'm serious. I'm absolutely that's, serious about that. Area five is uh, includes a lot of uh, Eagle Ridge, yeah. and that's me, and go. I'm leaving. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Trustee Fayak. Um, I did want to clarify something because I, I want to make sure I heard you correctly, um, Mr. Meza, that uh, if, and, and again, I'm just saying, if down the road, we do make a decision to move the DI program, you did mention that it was really for new incoming DI students. Students that are in DI programs currently will stay with Los Animas until they age out and go into uh, middle school. So I do wanna right. make that clarification. Oh, Correct. Um, because I think that was a concern for a lot of the parents. And if that's the case, Unless you have, unless you have, you know, students now that are not in school, because right now it's, uh, it'll affect them, but your current students, it will not affect. Is that yeah. correct? Mr. That, that's Mr. correct, Trustee Twin, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. That is exactly correct. If and when the board makes that decision, this is just, as I mentioned multiple times, the first time the board is hearing it, staff brought it up. 
as because of concerns the parents have raised about all the things that we've mentioned. This is the very first time the board is hearing about that. But should whenever, 10 years from now, whenever it is that the board should take action to the, that's not tonight, that will be the implementation. Uh, so if you're a kindergartner in DI right now, you will go through all fifth grade, um, promote to middle school in DI fifth grade. It's just this new enrollees of whenever the board implements that, that then would be shifting to another site. So there will be a process before any decision Absolutely. is made. And then once a decision is made, it will be phased in it, as appropriate. Absolutely. Yes, we will be informing, we will be talking to families. We will obviously bring it to the board for your approval. But if at all, that is a plan that we move forward with the students that are in DI right now, they would they would go through the program. It's for incoming DI students. And at that point, then parents have, you know, they have a choice. If if there is a different school that the DI program would be moved to, you have the option of not enrolling your student in a DI program. But the students that are in the program currently, they would not be impacted at all. Aside from the school being fairly large. Yeah. <laughs> Trustee Kim. Would this also increase the number of kids in the DI program if we were going to move it to a different school? It, 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 it could if we open another um, strand of DI somewhere like another else. Kinder, would yes, we add it, like another kinder class, yes. another cohort? That is an it option. Could. It's an uh, Of course, yes, we could it, actually expand. Yeah. And we are also looking at expansion another way, something which again, it's a trend we are looking at. As a district, we offer the seal of biliteracy for a lot of our DI students are, who are enrolled in K-12. Um, as we are beginning to open more TK programs, what we want to look into is also opening a TK DI program, which would be very unique. It's not something that's, that's very prevalent in other districts, but I think we have a unique opportunity to be a TK, actually a preschool. We are even looking at preschool. Uh, a preschool through 12th grade DI program, uh, which would, as a district, I, I think it's something we, we would be proud of. And it gives students an opportunity to be bilingual, biliterate. And just to be clear, TK is transitional, T transitional kindergarten, kindergarten, and that's the year before kindergarten. Yes. That is basically a new grade level in the state of California. Yes. Okay. Anybody else have uh, something to say? All right. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Clearly, we, we will be uh, discussing this further in the future. Item G, the monthly district cash flow update. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Oh, I know. Yeah, we got two diehards who are sticking it out. <laughs> I appreciate that, but good for you. Good for you. Thank <laughs> you. Hello. Hi, good evening, Dr. Munchi, members of the board. Uh, my name is Irma Argueta, and I'll be presenting the monthly district cash flow. Uh, this evening, I would like to bring you up to date on the general fund cash balances and provide you with some information. I'll start with this first slide, which shows the actuals there in the blue are July through December, and the columns in pink are January through June, which are our best projections based off of our current budget. Uh, on the cash, cash flow summary, um, you'll see the beginning cash balance for December is around 73 million. For December's revenue, we were a little over 27 million and the disbursements were around 15.8 million. As part of the $15.8 million in expenditures that belongs to salary for both uh, certificated and classified employees with total benefits that's around 11 million or looking at it at 70%. Our ending cash balance in December was around $83.7 million. And here on the chart is another way of looking at it. Do we have any questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. Trustees, any questions? 
I guess I have a question. All of a sudden, this seems, uh, oh, this is more important now. Uh, <laughs> how will I know as a trustee when something bad is coming? And when oh. when is the call to make a tran if, if deferrals and stuff happen? Well, that's what we do is we base our projections. They're in the pink columns, as you'll see, January through June. Mm -hmm. And that in there does show our revenues that will be coming in. Um, and our best projections as to our expenditures that will be including salary and benefits. Okay. When I look at the graph on the next page, <laughs> when will I know, hey, we need to do something differently? Oh. That's, that's kind of my question. <laughs> well, <laughs> when does Bursman's outpace receipts? Okay. <laughs> right. yeah. So so when the when, when the when like when let's red is bigger than blue? Let, well let's put yes. Well uh, and it continues, right? So it's June doesn't one, look so one. good. But so an example is um way back in I think Trustee Cristiano referred to this earlier, okay. when we had, and I think Trustee Good also alluded to this, is when we had um uh deficit factors, and that was really the language they used, deficit factor way back in the 2000s. Basically, what it meant is I get 80 cents of every dollar. And guess what? I was planning for a dollar or a dollar, right? A whole dollar. <laughs> but in February, I get told you're going to get 80 cents out of, you know, $120 million. Right. That is a problem, right? And because we're planning on receiving a whole value of a dollar. Now we get 80 cents. We can't meet payroll, uh, particularly when you can see that receipts of, let's say, February, we're looking at projecting at nine and, and, and it's outpaced in that one month. Well, that will be consistently the issue, right? For like several months. That's when we know, okay, we have a problem. Um, obviously in the May revision, we'll know if we have a deficit factor to plan for or not. And then we can flag and say, okay, well, we have $80 million or so, 83 in cash in the general fund. We also have out external cash borrowing from other funds that we could borrow up to 75% over $90 million today, but that's today. So we will look at this every single month as Irma and Kimberly do. Mm -hmm. We'll know what the payroll is, that's key, and the operational expenditures beyond payroll. So the flag is, if deficit factors are in place, if you get 80 cents on the dollar or 70, whatever it is, that's the issue. And then we'll come to you with a resolution to borrow, to issue a trend, because it has to come to the board. Mm -hmm. We come to the board and say, hey, board, we think we need $5 million, $12 million, as we've done in the past. Mm -hmm. And then all it means is it's just a temporary loan because we are matching up the state apportionment aid or the receipts to the um, disbursements. Thank you. And I want to make it very clear. I trust you guys very much with this. And I wasn't questioning your judgment. I just want to know what I should be thinking of and, and what the process is. It, educating the future board members in the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we don't need a tran. We're not thinking of tran in the short term. It's not at the moment. Future years if things start going wrong at the state level. We will let you know. Okay. Great news, thank okay. you. Yes. <laughs> Any thank other you. questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, next, item H, new contract between Gilroy Unified and Maxim Healthcare Services for Power School for this year and this summer, not to exceed $492,000. Ms. Wells Southland. Good evening. This evening, we are seeking uh, approval of the new contract with Maxim Healthcare Services to provide 10 behavior technicians um, for our seven elementary schools and our three middle schools as part of our continuation of services in the after school program. These will help provide a continuation of services as we talked about our MTSS, really bring the, bringing that into our after school programs, um, allowing us to better serve students who might be having some behavioral challenges, um, just some need for additional support um, in a more uh, formalized way than our, our, our current power school staff can, can authorize. Thank you very much. Trustees, uh, Trustee Pisano. Thank you, Trustee Pace. Um, I like this idea. I like the contract. I have a question about um, staffing. Can we actually, do we, will we be able to find the behavioral technicians? 
Yes, we are highly confident uh, Ms. Reedy and Ms. Polito have been really working very closely with Maxim Healthcare and they're confident that they can staff up um, to meet our needs. Great to hear, thank you. Trustee Fiak, Vice President Fiak. <laughs> um, could you explain maybe general generalization, what does a behavioral technician do? So we have students that might have issues with maybe dysregulation, they might have anxiety that may be a continuation from the school day or just appearing in the after school program. And they're gonna provide the support to the student. Maybe they have a behavior plan, a behavior contract, um, gathering data on the students and helping them regulate and be successful in the after school program. It might be providing break time, alternative activities, um, some of, you know, not true cognitive behavior therapy, but some of those best practices and helping a student be successful in, a, in what can be a really long day. They, that's up to a nine hour day. So these services will be really supportive to those. Great, thank you. Trustee Kim. Um, included in our packet, there was a job description for the board certificated behavior analyst. The BCBA? Yes. Yes. We're, but we're saying we're getting 10 behavior therapists. So we're, we're hoping to start with the 10 behavior therapists. The BCBA can be on call as needed if we are seeing students that have a higher need than the behavior technicians could support. So that's why it's included in the contract. So it's a, something that we are asking um, to, as an option, should we need it? But we're gonna start with the 10 behavior technicians to begin with. So then they would report to they will be reporting to the uh, Maxim Healthcare, so they they will provide that oversight. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, is it is this a therapist the same as a technician, or are they different? Or yeah, they <laughs> that's are, why I'm a little confused. Yeah, <laughs> a therapist is different, so they can provide actually therapeutic services. And we are, I think there was a, a a typo in our in the briefing. So the technician is a student, someone that is really working side by side. They can collect the data. They're working under the guidance of the Maxim Healthcare, the oversight provider, um, but they aren't actually making the decisions on like a, like a clinical um, therapeutic setting. Therapists are typically licensed employees. They, they have to have a license to practice where the technicians are trained in behavior, you know, handling behavior um, issues, but they're not licensed. Yeah, that's they, the difference. Yeah, they do have quite, you know, they have to go through a certification process to be considered a behavior technician. Talking about technicians and not therapists. We're talking about right? technicians, okay. yes. Comment, um, we are using Maxim Healthcare for these 10 positions because we cannot fill those within our staffing. Correct. Okay, correct. All right, discussion has run its course. Um, so now this is an action item and I will entertain a motion from the board. Motion to approve. I second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much. All right, item I, board member committee and school assignments. So. <laughs> hmm? <Nippy. laughs> so uh everyone thank you for your feedback and i tried to keep that in mind but i also mixed it up a little i moved some i kind of swapped people around here and there if uh if you don't like it i welcome feedback and especially if you want to swap with someone else if you find someone you want to trade with i'm good with that but when i asked you that you told me tough <laughs> <laughs> well that's just you oh, okay <laughs> Um, I, I said, put me wherever you need me and you took me and I did and you did. <laughs> <laughs> Where, I, and again, I welcome changes. I, Fine. I don't have a big stake in this and <laughs> <laughs> we all good. And if, if there's no discussion, I will entertain motion. Move approval. I second. All right, you second it, so there. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We've got some assignments, but horse trading is still acceptable if you really want to. 
Okay, now we come to item J, board policy revisions, second reading. So start reading, everyone. <laughs> that joke never gets old. <laughs> um, does any, we don't need to go through a presentation again. Does anybody have anything they want to say on this matter? Christy Nelson. I just want to say thank you to everybody who responded to my many, many questions. Thank you. We appreciate staff. You guys are best. <laughs> Um, I will entertain a motion to revise our policies. So move. I second. second. Oh, oh yeah. Give it to Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle. Yeah. Okay. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Boom. Okay. And did you guys know it was school board recognition month right now? Did and you? now we pass a resolution saying how great we are? <laughs> <laughs> But we appreciate you, so we wanted to recognize all of you. Uh, January is School Board Recognition Month, and uh, never done. I, on behalf of the district, our, our staff and community, wanted to thank our board trustees and just recognize the work that all of you do. Um, so I am going to read the resolution. Um, all right. Whereas an excellent public education system is vital to the quality of life for all California citizens and communities, and whereas our public education system has faced unprecedented circumstances these past three years as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas our local board of education continues to act to ensure children's academic, social, emotional, physical, and mental health needs are met at all times when students needed consistent services most, and whereas Board of Education members continue to advocate to best serve the children in our community each and every day, and whereas local Board of Education members are committed to children and believe that all children can be successful learners and that the best education is tailored to the individual needs of the child, and whereas Board of Education members work closely with parents, educational professionals, and other community members to create the healthiest environments possible where all children can thrive. And whereas Board of Education members are responsible for building and maintaining the structure that provides a solid foundation for our school system. And whereas Board of Education members are strong advocates for public education and are responsible for communicating the needs of school district to the public and the public's expectations to the district. And Whereas the mission of the public schools to meet the diverse educational needs of all children and to empower them to become competent, productive contributors to the democratic society and an ever-changing world is more poignant than ever before. Now, therefore, I, Anisha Munshi, do hereby declare my appreciation to the members of the Board of Education and proclaim the month of January 2024 as School Board Recognition Month in the Gilroy Unified School District. I urge all community members to join me in recognizing the dedication and hard work of local school board members and in working with them to create an educational system that meets the need, needs of all of our children, passed and adopted this 11th day of January 2024. Thank you so much. Melanie just left. She had to leave, but maybe we can get a picture of her. <laughs> oh, my yes, let's do that. It's not clear to me that this is going to pass. So let's. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, yeah. Um, I think I heard like a friendly amendment to add a statue. Was yeah, that there what? you go. <laughs> Twenty years. <laughs> um. Trustee Fisano. I just want to say in all the years that I've been coming to board meetings, far more than I ever want to admit, this is the first time that there's been a resolution for board members. And uh, thank you. It's I thank you. When I first saw it, I was like, did I read that correctly? <laughs> you know? So thank you very much. And thank you very much for the applause and the support. Appreciate it. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Got a vote. Uh, anybody else have anything to say? 
I, I guess thank you, but it just seems weird that yeah. we're gonna vote. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I dare someone to make a motion, right? This is... <laughs> I move approval. Whoa. <laughs> I'll second. All right. Let's go. Yeah, see, we... With no amendments. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate the sentiment, but if, if I knew someone on a different board and they voted for this, I would make fun of them for the rest of their life. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate it because no one thanks us for anything ever. So thank you. I do appreciate yes. that. But I, I can't, I, I, I don't want I don't want to vote for this because it's it's telling me what a great guy I am. And, and, and we all knows, know the truth. We know the truth. Yeah, exactly. So I, I mean, I, I, I can't vote for it myself. You may abstain. I will. All right. Unless, unless, unless we had the statue. In it. <laughs> we could do a statue. Somebody fold up some paper that looks like Mark. Exactly. <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second. This is a this is a roll call vote, please. No, we're not done yet. It is not clear that this is going to pass. Yes. 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 It's weird. It's it's really weird. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe old stain so Mark's not by himself. Hey, what? We, what? We might should, lose should it. I vote yes? <laughs> I vote? What? No, I should vote yes. I should do. <laughs> Fine. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. All right. <laughs> Motion carries six with one abstention. If we it's don't official. say if we, we are awesome. If we don't say that we're good, why would anybody else say we're good? Mr. Good. <laughs> Keep up the good. I don't know. Look at that huge audience out there. In <laughs> we will now have a picture opportunity on, during this item. Thank you. The horn tooting resolution has passed. <laughs> this brings us to item nine, action and information items regarding maintenance and facilities. We will begin with the monthly maintenance operations and facilities update. Mr. Nato. Oh. Good evening, Dr. Munchi, President Pace, and awesome board members. I'm very happy to present this evening. Uh, we'll do a quick update on facilities. So as you may know, we've uh, broken ground at the Antonio Del Bono State Preschool Program. Um, we're underway. We should be done um, right at the end of the school year this year. Um, before we get into like a, uh, a picture program of, of Antonio Del Bono, um, what I thought we would do, well, what I thought we would do by way of my project manager, Marissa, 
who did an excellent job putting these slides together, um, is let you know where we're moving out of, because it's probably the only time and probably the last time uh, we're going to mention this building. This is the current residence of the uh, Swanston Preschool. Um, it's at 240 Swanston Lane. And as you can tell, uh, so these are drawings from a 1949 uh, modernization project. And um, they are the oldest drawings to date that we have of the site. Um, the, the original plans we found were built, uh, the building was built in 1911 to be uh, temporary housing for when the first, well, I shouldn't say the first high school, but the Gilroy Union High School District building was built uh, right on IOF. Um, so on subsequent pages, you'll see, this is the profile of the building. Um, that's the top view is, if you were standing at the South Valley track and field right now, looking north, you, this is what you would see. And this is mostly the uh, Swanson Preschool. That's their back patio deck. And it looks almost identical. Um, and then there's the front. Um, the left-hand side of the page is mostly the preschool. And the two wings on the right-hand side, this is the middle image that you're looking at, um, both house mostly maintenance and the facilities department. Um, and then the bottom's a side profile. Some interesting notes. Um, I don't know how well you can see this on your slides, but uh, this is one of the original incarnations of the building. And uh, Marissa's done a great job putting together what currently is uh, taking place in all those spaces and uh, what they used to be. There used to be a dining hall there, lounge area. There was a rifle range equipment and games reception area. Um, so at one point, students at, at this school would collect rifles and walk down the street to the Grange um, where they took rifle or marksmanship. Um, the, from what I understand, the girl students were uh, um, doing archery. The boy students were doing uh, marksmanship. Um, so early 1900s information. Um, this was a large agricultural and ag agricultural mechanics shop after it was temporary housing. Um, it's obviously been in play uh, for quite a while. Uh, the preschool side, which is uh, in the red outline, is it's actually in great shape inside. If you walked through it, it's it's actually a for a 120 something year old building. It's it's actually in pretty good shape. Our side, I'm not going to go into that side. Um, it's, it's a little less, but, uh, but we're making do. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, sometimes begrudgingly if there's a skunk in town. Um, so, uh, but lastly, I'll give you a, a quick update on the footprint of the Antonio Del Bono State Preschool. On the left-hand side, you'll see where the buildings are going to be um, dropped. Right now, there, there's a big vacant space over there. Uh, we moved the existing buildings out because they were uh, not really repairable, so we had those removed. And we will be bringing in the buildings that we cribbed over at... Uh, at our yard from the South Valley site. This used to be the um, SCOE's uh, first five, I believe, uh, preschool. So we're going to move those into play and then we're going to replicate that. Uh, so this will be housed with uh, two preschool classrooms, staff on the bottom left, and that courtyard entry is at the end of that blue arrow there. And then there's going to be some staffing uh, and counseling and uh, student services that take place on the right-hand side, along with a uh, uh, SPED classroom, actually two SPED classrooms, and then officing for that space as well. So I really look forward to showing you updates over the next few months, over the next several months. Paul, when do we expect that to be completed and move in ready? So we have a uh, com uh, project completion date of July 11th right now, and based on our history with Flint, I'd, I'd put money on right around that date. Um, we'll, 
over that summer, we'll be doing a light, we have a licensing process that takes place uh, congruently. So uh, we're scheduling that to occur right around July. Uh, so yeah, we don't want to miss that deadline. Do I recall like Ninth Street, it took a long, long time to get licensed or am I misremembering that? So you would expect like come fall kids, kids oh. in there? Yes, because we're we're anticipating it. So licensing is going to be well aware of it. Okay, they're welcome to actually come pre inspect. Um, so that way, during final inspection, they want to see all of the furniture in place. We plan for that to occur right at the end of the school year. Okay. Uh, so if there's any issues, we still have three months or eight weeks to rectify anything. But we generally work hand in hand, and there's an expert in licensing at our architect. Okay. So not really expecting any issues. Great. That's basically all I have for you for an update. I'll move into our subsequent items if you, you have wish. any questions about the update. Where are all the guns from the armory now? <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, go on, please, Paul. Sure. Uh, with that, I'll move on to items 9B through 9E. Uh, item 9B is the approval of a new MOU or Memorandum of Understanding with the Santa Clara County Office of Ed, also known as SCOE, for the installation of a pathway at Glenview Elementary School, not to exceed $135,641.40. Uh, this is an action item, and this is a uh, this is a pathway that we're going to um, install. It's going to go from the east side to the west side of of the playground uh, grass yard. So, if you're familiar with the the Glenview um, play area, this basically will connect Eighth Street to Ninth Street all through that grass area, mostly around the perimeter. In fact predominantly around the perimeter. So it brings the yard a little bit smaller, but it gives a, a terrifically long walking path. This is a joint project that we're doing with SCOE. So it basically gives us a $300,000 pathway for half the price because it's conjoint. Uh, so we're splitting the cost with SCOE and this will be, uh, our balance will actually come out of measure E. So it will be a bond project um, and it should be done this summer. There any questions on that item? Can could you bring a picture, a, a vision of that to a future meeting if you don't you have bet. it right now? No problem. Yes, we've got very limited uh, uh, drawings of it right now, but I'll get a rendering together for you. Great. Uh, item nine C is the approval of a contract with Anaya Construction Incorporated for the relocation of pre preschool classrooms for Antonio Del Bono State Preschool, which we just saw. Um, not to exceed $38,700. This is the contract with Anaya Constructions. They specialize in moving uh, portable, uh, relocatable buildings. They're our local specialist. Uh, they've actually been moving buildings in our district for quite some time, well before I got here. Um, they'll help us move those buildings over uh, so Flint can do their magic and get this project done. Uh, so that work is scheduled to be done in February. So we don't have to buy new buildings. We have buildings already that we're repurposing. That's smart. That is correct. Yes. Thank you for noticing. I blush. <laughs> <laughs> um, item 9D is the approval of a contract with Ground Penetrating Radar Systems, LLC, for the scanning of shade structure sites prior to the drilling. <laughs> not to exceed $3,600. This is a, uh, a new policy and directive that we perform. Uh, we scan all of anything, any project that, um, that we end up knowing that we're going to have to penetrate uh, the ground, go near any utilities that are underground, we wanna know about it. So what we're doing is uh, we're scanning ahead of time. So we hopefully don't hit any utilities under underground. Um, as you may know, we've had some rather unfortunate luck with some contractors uh, on a few projects and have made this uh, a new policy. So this uh, cost will cover the, the cost of scanning the three sites, uh, Los Animas Elementary, uh, Rucker Elementary, and Mount Madonna High School will all be scanned. Um, it's also worth noting that we're collecting this data and we've got another project in play where we're mapping all of this and collecting that as a database. So we have 
a very extensive knowledge for our projects and maintenance uh, anytime we need to go uh, below ground on any of our sites. Is this contract doing the entire site or just the affected area? Just the affected areas. So there's uh, there's three affected areas at Los Animas, there's two affected areas at Rucker, and there's one affected area at Mount Madonna. And then lastly, my last item is uh, 9E, which is the approval of a contract with ARC Document Solutions for uh, SkySight software lease renewal, uh, not to exceed $6,320.04. This is the repository or the quote Google Drive uh, that we utilize for all of our architectural plans. They're housed uh, online and when we work with an architect, we actually share those files. They provide a redundant backup for us, um, not only a chronology, but a, uh, a backup for all that data. We're also in the process of migrating many decades of uh, of documents that have historically been on paper. So we're, we're scanning those, putting them into that database uh, and collecting that data. It's, it's an arduous process, but uh, this tool has helped us over the years uh, keep that repository of data uh, intact. So this is just the annual renewal. I'll entertain any questions. Has that software uh, been reviewed by our IT department to make sure it complies with all of our needs? It has indeed many times, I believe. Um, looking at a phone a friend, but I, I believe so, yes. There was a nod from the IT department. Yes. Okay, trustees, any questions? I Melissa. do. Um, on item D for the ground penetrating radar systems, um, I know there's commercial advertisements out there, pg e you can call before you dig. And why, are, why don't we do that rather than this? This is a... Um, this is one of those cases where you get what you pay for. Um, so I will let you know, we did 811 for the sites that, uh, that's what we call it, 811. It's the PG&E free service. Um, generally speaking, they will not go on a public um, site, whether it's a city site or a school. They have, and they've had no problem with it down here, but generally, and I don't know why, but they generally shy away from doing any public works uh, for free. Um, but it's not to say they haven't because they did, they came on site on many of our projects, their scope of responsibility and their scope is not very wide. And we don't want to settle for that. We really want three different types of radar penetration, and we want to go about eight feet deep. Um, those elements don't always occur with 811. So that's generally why it's not a very expensive process for us. So that's generally why we, we don't take the free service, although we will, we just don't rely on it. We'd really like to have that taken place. Did, did we in Hopefully. fact rely on it and if, then have issues? If I may, we had a real live example the first day of school at Luigi. <laughs> we used 811 locate and our guys are there, not our guys, but our contractors there digging up you know poles and we had to shut the school down midway morning. So this is the reason why we brought this to the subcommittee. The subcommittee agreed this is a new policy and that's what we're going forward with it. Would it be beneficial to have our own locating in-house? Yeah. I mean, it would be great to play with those toys, but no, it's generally a, um, it's a skill set that a contractor would be better suited for. It's, and there's evolving technology. So for us to get into that game and have that in-house that regularly would outspend our need for it. Generally, we don't get into the ground a lot. Uh, we do for most every project, but not a lot. And it's probably far less expensive and probably much better that a professional do it than we, than we try to accomplish that in-house. A licensed and bonded one. Although I do like toys, I would say, <laughs> you know, I would take the toys. I'm just saying it's probably district's best to stick with the professionals to do it. Okay, any further discussion on items eight, uh, sorry, nine B through E? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion. I Move approval. approval. We have a motion and a second. This is not roll call, so all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motions carry unanimously. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. This brings us to item 10, board member reports. Board members, you may report. Trustee Kim. I will share. And um, before Christmas break, I had the opportunity to go over to Glenview and help walk um, I don't, a lot of kids over from Glenview to Gilroy High. And at Gilroy High, there was a fabulous presentation from the drama and dance teacher class. Um, and all the elementary kids were like in awe um, just being on the high school campus. It was super cute um, to be there and just talk to talk to the elementary kids and also the high school kids. Um, so I love, I guess they do this every year. It's a great partnership that um, that is there. It was fun. That's super cool. Anyone else? Okay, item 11, upcoming and new referral agenda items. Anybody have any new or referral agenda items? Being none, announcements. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held on Thursday, February 8th. Closed session at 5.30. Not that. Regular meeting at 7. The agenda will be posted by 5 o'clock on Friday, February 2nd. And we are adjourned. Thank you very much.